Okay, well, thank you, Marcus, for the introduction, and thank you to the organizer for setting up such an interesting meeting in this beautiful uh, town of Vienna. Um, so actually, in this first slide, I have already a summary of what I like to talk about, but of course, that I will elaborate on all that. So as we already heard this morning, the violation of abel inequality presents us with a tremendous challenge to tell stories about how things happen in nature. You know, in physics, we know that we can compute things. We know Hilbert spaces, state vectors, self adjoint operators, and all that, and we can compute and give exams to our students. But actually, in order to teach or actually to communicate, we also need to tell stories. So physics is not only mathematics, it is also about telling how things happen. And uh, this non-local correlations, by that I mean the correlations that violate some bell inequality, is a real challenge to tell a consistent story. And one way of telling a story is certainly, and it makes sense, to look for a universal privilege reference frame. So it would be a reference frame a bit like the one in which the microwave background radiation is isotropic. And according to such a hypothetical privilege reference frame, which would be kind of a Newtonian space-time, then the story is easy, because you say Alice is doing the measurement first, and that has an effect, and then Bob does a measurement on a different state because of the effect caused by Alice. But now the kind of story I would like to tell has to go a step further than that. I want that things really happen in this Newtonian space-time. So what Alice is doing, assuming she is first, is to trigger some influence that will propagate from Alice to Bob continuously, or contiguously, you know, from space to space, and carry with itself some influence, some information that will affect Bob or the state at Bob's side, and consequently also Bob's measurement result. And the main result I like to present today is that if you have such a story, if you tell such a story, and you could imagine that this is happening at this quantum level, at the quantum level there would be this finite speed, but possibly superluminal, but finite speed, hidden influence, but that this influence would just not show up at our level. It would remain on the quantum realm, and at our level we have no signaling, we have no faster finite communication. Um, and the result is that actually quantum non-locality, or a, a story telling about quantum non-locality based on finite speed causal influences, leads to superluminal communication also at the classical level, at our scale. And so if you don't believe in faster finite communication at our scale, you have to give up the idea of uh, finite speed influences. Okay, and in order to introduce that, let me come back to some other form of non-locality, very different, but one which we understand better, which is Newton's non-locality. You know, according to Newton's universal uh, gravitation theory, between, let's say, Earth and the Moon, between any two masses, uh, if a stone is moved on the Moon, that would have an immediate effect, and it's the immediate which is the non-locality here, uh, on the gravitational field on Earth. So you could, in principle, communicate at an infinite speed if the theory would really correspond to reality. But So if you have such a theory that tells these kind of stories, I think the very natural question to ask is how can these two locations out there in space-time know about each other? How can the Earth know that something has moved on on the moon, without anything carrying that information from the moon to Earth. And of course, this is a kind of story we know the answer today, uh, thanks to Einstein and so on. Uh, but also interesting is that if someone had tested this prediction, this prediction, he would have falsified Newton's theory, which would already have been a great achievement, and moreover, he would have found that gravity actually propagates at the speed of light. So that would have been a tremendous uh, experimental success. Of course, at Newton's time, that was impossible. And actually, even today, technology does not allow one to do this kind of experiment. 
Well, at least as a Gedanken experiment, you could think of that. Okay, so that's the situation here. And I think it's good to remind ourselves that even Newton himself was very much aware of this peculiar uh, characteristic of his theory, since he wrote that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else by and through which the action and force may be conveyed from one to the other is to me, so to Newton, so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matter a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. So Newton was telling us you have to be completely mad to believe in, our, in, in my uh, universal gravity theory. Nevertheless, of course, during centuries, uh, we learned about that, and actually, I'm sure that many of you are still teaching that. But it's clearly absurd, no? How could something jump from one place to another? So I guess th this kind of idea that you cannot have instantaneous action at a distance without anything carrying that uh, leads to the, to the fact that signaling is a non-physical communication. Uh, to send information, one has to encode this information into some physical support and send this physical support to the receiver. That's the way to communicate, whether it is per email or per uh, old-fashioned uh, letters. And any other way of communicating, so without encoding the information into some physical support, is what I would call signaling or in other words, it would be non-physical communication. And at least between physicists or among physicists, we don't believe in non-physical communication. Now, in addition to being non-physical, signaling would also allow faster than light communication, because since anyway nothing is carrying this information, the distance is not important. So you could have whatever distance, uh, and then you could have whatever speed. In particular, you could have it faster than the speed of light. But notice that no signaling is more fundamental than relativity. So I prefer to define no signaling as this non-physical communication, and the faster than light just comes as a side product. OK, and then uh, that leads also to the principle of continuity, okay, which is very close to the Reichenbach principle. So everything, mass, energy, information, propagates gradually and continuously, or contiguously. In French, we have a good expression, de proche en proche, but there is no real translation for that in English. But it really means from nearby to nearby, contiguously, uh, through space as time passes. So nothing jumps instantaneously from here to there. There's no instantaneous teleportation. And consequently, correlations can have only two types of explanations. Either it comes from a common cause, common local cause, so something is going, coming from here, propagating to A, and some, possibly the same information, but carried by a different physical support, carries that to B, or there is a direct communication, a direct uh, cause here, or influences at finite speed. And so this part is very well known, and we already heard about that this morning, so you will have explanations by common cause, so you have variables that could be hidden, but that's not very important whether they're hidden or not, but they have to be local, and that leads to Bell's theorem that is in contradiction with quantum predictions and with experiments, so it is falsified. So remains the other one, direct cause, explanation of correlations by one event influencing another one. So here the, the, the key concept is no longer a variable, but it is an influence, and here the idea is to assume that this is hidden on this quantum level that would not come up to our level. And the key assumption here is also finite speed. I want something that really propagates, not something that jumps instantaneously everywhere, it propagates. So it has a finite speed. And that is the subject of this talk. So just to illustrate that, so the one possibility would be that when Alice makes a measurement, there is this hidden influence going to Bob, and then when Bob makes his measurement, of course he can get whatever results, knowing both inputs. But if you now do an experiment where on both sides 
you on purpose synchronize the questions good enough, then the influence will arrive too late. And if the synchronization is good enough, you understand that whatever the speed of this hidden influence, it will arrive too late. Of course, it requires a very good synchronization. And in this case, you would have this bell locality condition. Okay. Now, fast off and light, I mean, usually physicists, maybe not in this audience, but standard physicists, if you say fast off and light, they stand up and move out. Uh, but you have to understand that fast and finite influences defined in one universal privilege reference frame, for instance, the one that I already mentioned, uh, given by cosmology, is such that there is no grandfather paradox. It is not that you can go faster than the speed of light in any possible reference frame, but there is one kind of Newtonian reference frame, and in this given assumed reference frame, you have a faster than light uh, speed. But then this speed will not uh, lead to any, any uh, uh, grandfather paradox, not more than in Newtonian mechanics. In Newtonian mechanics, there is no speed limit, and you can go faster than the speed of light in theory, in Newtonian theory, and clearly that doesn't lead to any grandfather paradox. So you can have a consistent uh, story here. And so some years ago, we did an experiment where we wanted to test that. So we did our best to synchronize measurements on Alice's side and on Bob's side here, over these 18 kilometers in this case. And we used the fibers from our national uh, telecom operator, Swisscom. And OK, so the, these two fibers had to be, you know, all the distance have to be well uh, uh, synchronized or the, or the same distance. And then I'm not I don't want to talk about the experiment, but you have to let the experiment run during uh, at least 12 hours so that the, the Earth rotation allows you to really scan all possible reference frames because you don't know which is the privileged reference frame. Anyway, so we did that experiment, so this uh, Salacht experiment, and uh, we c could find a bound because the synchronization was, of course, not absolutely perfect. So we got a bound on the hypothetical speed or on the speed of this hypothetical influence of 10 to 10,000 times the speed of light. So much faster than the speed of light. And this kind of experiment was then uh, reproduced in, uh, in Italy by Bruno Cocciaro and his group, and then by Jay Wei Pan in China, on always finding more or less the same numbers here. So you have a number which is large. No? 10,000 times the speed of light is, is a large number. And well, it could be that the influence is merely propagating faster. Maybe it was at one million times, or one ten million times the speed of light. How can you argue against that? It's still possible. Um, of course, it may also simply not exist. And if you think about that, as long as you have two parties, Alice and Bob, you will never be able to exclude hidden influences. All what you can do is to set experimentally lower bounds on speed. Just by increasing the, the precision of your experiment, you can get to 10,000 to a million and so on. And actually, uh, Bruno Cocciaro is working on an experiment to improve on our results, to really get beyond a million. But with two parties, you cannot do better than that. Uh, but interesting is that we'll see with uh, more parties you can do better. So let's also motivate what I'm telling you by some quotations. So for instance, Bell said that uh, correlations between distance events uh, strongly suggest that something is going on behind the scene. So really this kind of hidden influences that might be propagating behind the scene. But also uh, David Bohm and uh, uh, Basil uh, Hille who is probably somewhere here now. Is he here? Apparently not. But nevertheless, he wrote and signed the book. So <laughs> uh, it is quite uh, possible that quantum non-local connections might be propagated not at infinite speed, or in Bohmian mechanics, but at speeds very much greater than that of light. In this case, we could expect observable deviations from the predictions of current quantum theory. So. And that was, okay, that was in 93, but I guess the idea is actually much older than that. So it's the same kind of idea. Maybe there is something going on there. And also, if you take any standard textbook, and probably the way you also teach uh, quantum mechanics, 
You tell things like that. A first measurement collapses the entire wave function, hence changes or influences the state of all systems entangled with the measured system. So that's the usual story that we tell our students how to explain correlations. You do a measurement, it collapses the state function, and that, of course, changes the state of affair at Bob. So let's formalize that. And we call that V causality. V for this speed, this speed of this hypothetical uh, influence. And V, we assume, is finite. Could be whatever, but a finite number. Uh, can be larger than the speed of light. And so the idea is that whenever an event happens, so a measurement result ha comes out, the rest of the universe is informed at that speed. And whenever the hidden influence arrives on time, then future events are correlated as predicted by quantum mechanics. So if Alice does a measurement, the second measurement is in her future, and far enough in the future for this hidden influence to arrive, then we get quantum mechanics as we know it. However, whenever the hidden influence does not arrive on time, then events can only be, be Bell local correlated. Then we would necessarily have Bell locality. So we can still be correlated, but by a common past. And so because of that, V causality predictions may differ from quantum predictions. And that is the difference with Bohm. In Bohm, this V is infinite. So it's immediately everywhere. And if it's immediately everywhere, it of course arrives on time. And what we shall see is that this hidden influence at finite speed leads to signaling at the macroscopic level. So it cannot remain uh, hidden at the quantum level. So just again to illustrate that. So in, in addition, now if we go to this privileged reference frame with space and time, privileged time also, we have the light cone as usual. But then we have the V cone. And the V cone, if V is larger than the speed of light, will be more open. And then we will have events which are V-connected and events that are not V-connected. OK, now if you assume uh, only hidden influence at finite speed and no shared randomness, so no local variables at all, so we're moving a, a, a bit again, so, uh, uh, away from what I just said, so we'll make the assumption for just now, I think, two slides, that everything is only due to uh, finite speed uh, influences without shared randomness. And that will illustrate in a, I think, relatively simple way how this hidden influence would actually allow you to have faster than light communication. So let's suppose we have a, a GHG state, so 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1, 3 qubits, 1 qubit held by Alice, and uh, 10 years light away, so very far away, we have Bob and Charlie that hold the second and third qubit. And Bob and Charlie are maybe only 10 kilometers away, so they have some distance between them, uh, in such a way that between Bob and Charlie, we can have good enough synchronization, or quasi-perfect synchronization, but good enough, so there's no time for any hidden influence going from Bob to Charlie, nor from Charlie to Bob. So these are independent, because there's no hidden influence going from one to the other, and in here we assume no uh, local variables, no shared randomness. So what is going to happen? In the case Alice does just nothing, and Bob and Charlie, they do their measurements with this perfect or quasi-perfect synchronization. So if Alice does, me does nothing, when Bob and Charlie, well, Bob, his local state, his local quantum state, is just one half of zero plus one half of one. And Charlie also has the same state, but we cannot communicate because of the assumption, so we get independent outcomes. So we ha all the four possible outcomes, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, will be equally likely. However, if Alice does first measure sigma z, and Bob and Charlie later, but later meaning here, on, uh, waiting long enough for this hypothetical hidden influence to propagate from Alice to Bob and from Alice to Charlie, when later we do the measurement also of sigma z. So they all measure in the sigma z basis, the computational basis. Then whatever Alice obtains as a result, let's say she obtains a zero, when the entire state, well, the Alice will, will uh, 
influence Bob so that Bob will also get a state zero, and Alice will influence Charlie so that Charlie also gets the state zero. So they all get the state zero. That means that Bob and Charlie always get the same result. They could also both get result one, but they get the same result. They will never get one zero and zero one. Okay? So now it takes some time for them to communicate and establish their correlation, but that can be much shorter than this 10 year light that I, uh, I mentioned here, this huge distance. And consequently, there is communication from Alice to Bob and Charlie, and this communication is propagated by this hidden influence at a speed which is the speed of this hypothetical influence, which can be faster than the speed of light. So you get faster than light communication at the macroscopic level, just at the, at the level where you do measurements and you collect data. Now, if you just look at that, you say, okay, that is uh, correct. But there is an easy way out of that. And the easy way out, an immediate objection, is that whenever the hidden influence, influence doesn't arrive on time, the outcome could be determined by local variables. So let's add now also local variables. So that is a, an explanation that combines now the local variables and the finite speed influences. And now, here is an example with four parties. And now I allow both finite uh, speed hidden influences and shared randomness, so and local variables. And have four parties, Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Dave. And they are organized in such a way that in this privileged reference frame, Alice is first to do her measurement, Dave is second, and Dave is connected, is V connected to Alice. So Dave's outcome can, of course, depend on Alice. And then later comes Bob. Again, Bob is also V connected to Dave. So consequently, ABD, this correlation, is quantum, because they are connected. The same, Charlie is also V connected to Dave, so ACD is also quantum. However, B and C, they are outside each other's V cones, so they are not V connected. And consequently, BC, this correlation, that must be local, or Bell local, if you prefer. And it has to be Bell local, whatever happened before. So even if you condition on what Alice and, and Dave did before, it has to be local. OK, that is really the, a consequence of this model that everything comes out from uh, local variables and uh, finite speed hidden influences. And then there is a theorem. Uh, the theorem applies to the case where the inputs, sorry, where the inputs here, the inputs are binary, let's label them 0 and 1, and the outputs are also binary, but here I use uh, physics bits, so plus or minus 1. And so the notation is, as you say, so A, B, C, D for the output of Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Dave, and so on. And then the theorem says that if this probability, this joint conditional probability of getting the results A, B, C, D, given X, Y, Z, and W, uh, so W being the input of Dave, uh, is formally non-signaling. And by formally non-signaling, what I mean is, for instance, I trace out Alice. So if I make the sum over Alice, the marginal probability distribution that I will get will not depend on X, because I have traced out Alice. So it will no longer depend on x. And the same if I trace out any other party or, or uh, several parties. And if moreover, now the marginal bc is local for, any, for, for whatever Alice and Dave did, then there is a certain inequality. This inequality happens to read j small or equal to 7, j being written here. So how do you find such an inequality? So this is a technical very, technically very difficult problem because you have to put into your game a huge polytope, so in a large space, and no signaling polytope. So no sig signaling polytopes are technically defined by their facets. And then you have to make the intersection of that polytope with another polytope, which is now a local polytope. Uh, and we know how to define that, but you want then to define, uh, but these polytopes are defined by the vertices. 
And already finding intersections between two different polytopes is difficult in high dimensions. And whenever the two polytopes are not given in the same way, it is difficult. And then moreover, we want that in the expression we get here, and I'll come back why we want that, but we have no BC terms. So B, Bob and Charlie never appear. If you look in all these terms, Bob and Charlie never appear in the same expression. And um, so that is also something uh, important. So technically, you, you need then to project onto a sub, uh, well, a smaller dimension to get that. And then moreover, we would like, of course, that you have a quantum violation. So it's very difficult to find these inequalities. But once you have an inequality, and here I give it to you, it is easy to demonstrate that this is indeed an inequality and that this theorem really holds. So the, the proof of the theorem is easy, but it's very difficult to find the theorem here. OK, so let's look again at this, uh, this thing. So we have all these expressions, and Bob and Charlie never appear at the same time. So you have either just Alice, so that means that's the average on, on Alice, and the expectation value for the input 0, that's the expectation value for Bob for the input 0, let's see. Here, you, you multiply the results of Alice, Bob, and Charlie when Alice has input 1, Bob 1, and Dave 0, and so on. And you will see you ha never have, you may have Bob and Dave, or so on, but you will never have Bob and Charlie together. And because you never have Bob and Charlie together, and you have this kind of configuration in this privileged reference frame, the consequence is that any v-causal model will predict the same value for g as, the quantum, as quantum mechanics because you will always have Ava terms which involve A, B, and D, and this is quantum, or it involves A, C, and D, or a subset. But this is again quantum. And so the V causal predictions in general differ from quantum theory, but since this expression of J doesn't contain any terms involving B and C, the V causal prediction for J is, a, is merely the same as the quantum value. So although we don't have an explicit construction for a hidden influence model or theory, we can make predictions for the value of this specific j. Also, if you think in terms of an experiment, uh, that would uh, a good thing is that you never the difficulty in an experiment would be again to make sure that B and C are that well synchronized that they are outside each other uh, v cones. But in an experiment you never need to measure Bob and Charlie at, in the same run of the experiment. And so you have no Bob-Charlie timing issue. So experimentally, this is more friendly. OK, now there is, as I said, there is the fact that there are some quantum states and measurements that predict a violation. But now, this just remind you the theorem. So the consequence of this violation now is that since in any v-causal model, bc is local, so the second assumption is always satisfied, because that's the definition of v-causality, then the, the assumption that has to go, because you violate the conclusion, is the first assumption. So that the four-party correlation here must be formally signaling. So if I trace some of these parties out, the results may depend on the input of the parties that were traced out. And maybe just a side remark, you have now, okay, four parties is the first example we found, but since then my student, uh, Tomer Bernier, found also an example using only three parties, so you don't need to go to four. We know that two is insufficient and three is sufficient. Okay. And uh, another little remark, if you just now forget all that, but. I think it's also a nice result is that now if you would assume no signaling, you know, in many contexts you assume no signaling, and you get this violation, then you can infer that BC share non-local correlations, although you have never measured them. So it's a way of inferring non-local correlations between, in this case, Bob and Charlie, without ever measuring Bob and Charlie in the same run of an experiment. OK, so this so far is signaling at this formal level. But now let's look how you can make that indeed also signaling and faster fan light signaling at the level of classical inputs and outputs. And let's suppose that the, it is by tracing out Alice that you get uh, that the correlation between Bob, Charlie, and Dave still depend on Alice's input. 
you could also, it could be symmetric that it's on, from Dave to Alice, but one of the two has to hold. Um, so in this case, let's suppose so Alice chooses her input, and in blue is still the, the light cone. So this is the speed of light. This is the speed of the hypothetical hidden influence. Now, whenever Bob and Charlie, we make their measurements, they get outcomes, and these outcomes and inputs, we send at the speed of light to Dave. So at this point here, Dave knows, of course, his own input and output. Here he learns about the input and output from um, Charlie, and here from Bob. So at this point, he knows the BCD correlation. But now if this BCD correlation depends on Alice's inputs, we have this formal signaling, then he will notice here at this point in time that whether Alice has chosen her input x equals 0 or her input x equals 1. No? And this happens before uh, anything at the speed of light could reach Dave. So this is faster than the speed of light. Now if you make all this picture larger and larger like that, uh, you can go faster and faster, and you can asymptotically reach that the speed of this information now that goes from Alice to Dave gets asymptotically uh, equal to the speed of the hypothetical hidden influence. So you can really go at the speed of this hidden influence. But now it is not at, the, at this hidden quantum level, it is really at the level of macroscopic inputs and outputs, at the, the level of what we do in the labs. So what we have achieved so far, how am I doing? Yeah. Is to, to show that here also, if we have a direct cause, we get a contradiction with faster fine light communication, and hence this is also falsified. So you can just say, okay, now both common cause, direct cause, or actually even combination of common and direct causes, uh, don't work, you cannot tell a story like that. So nature does not satisfy this principle of, of continuity, and in this sense, nature is non-local. So th I think that's a, a, a nice result. I have to admit that I'm very proud of that result. It took us a long time, and actually I didn't say, but on the, on the main paper we are many co-authors, because it took me to, to convince many people to work on the problem until actually mostly Stefano Pironio and Jean-Daniel Bancal found this fa famous theorem. We are good in handling these large polytopes, and we found that, that example, that theorem. Uh, but there, there are still a lot of questions. Now, for instance, how does an event A know that it is non-locally correlated to an event B? Now, we have these non-local correlations in the sense of violating Bell inequality. It is not because of some common cause. It is not because of finite speed uh, influences, uh, so how can that happen? And who keeps track of who is entangled with whom? So are there out there some angels that manipulate huge Hilbert spaces and keep track of the quantum state of the universe to know who is entangled with whom? That's what our textbook says, but I mean, besides that, we don't mention the angel. But uh, that's the way, essentially, it goes. And, uh, we need to tell stories about that. One kind of example where this has a kind of uh, relevance, if, if you go to multi-party non-locality, so more than two, and then you have different ways of, of defining multi-party non-locality, uh, so-called uh, Svetlichny inequalities, and there are different concepts here that we uh, elaborate in this paper, but I don't want to go into that here now. So how should I, what should I really conclude from all that? So, well, a violation of this inequality now implies either a violation of this principle of continuity. I guess that's the standard answer that physicists will tell. Yes, that's the way it is. Of course, there's another possibility also. Maybe uh, the possibility of faster fine light communication at the level of classical measurement settings or results. So this is really in complete contradiction with relativity. But maybe that is also a possibility. At least from a logical point of view, this is clearly also a possibility. So we should also consider that as a, as a possibility. And to really 
distinguish these two, well, you have to do an experiment. Uh, you, you have to do an experiment which is better than this uh, Salart experiment and the Italian and Chinese experiment that I mentioned. Um, but okay, now most people would say there is no faster than light, so we go for a violation of the principle of continuity. Although there is no grandfather paradox, again, I, I emphasize here. Okay, so um, at the end, what still remains is how to tell a consistent theory about quantum non-locality. Actually, I told you that a very natural kind of story would be with this hidden influence. I think we all had that kind of idea in ourselves because it's so natural. That's the way it happens in everyday life, that someone influences someone else. So it's a very natural idea. Like the common cause is also a very natural idea. But so once you have ruled out all these possibilities, the questions remain, and you still want to tell a story. But such a story will necessarily have to use some non-local concepts. There is no way to tell a story which is entirely local, uh, except if you go to infinite speeds, like in Boomian mechanics. But I consider infinite speed to be almost a contradiction in terms. I mean, nothing can propagate instantaneously. But OK, that's to, to debate. But so an example of a non-local uh, terminology which allows you to tell stories is something like non-local randomness. By this I mean a random event that can manifest itself at several locations. So since now we know that in quantum mechanics there is randomness, there is indeterminism, that's a very big difference and I guess we have to change our mindset and say, okay, if it is really random, but intrinsically random, it's not ignorance, clearly, it's really intrinsically random, but if it is intrinsically random, why should that randomness um, manifest itself only at one location? There's nothing uh, that prevents a random event to manifest itself at several locations, two or more. I have only two hands, but two or more. And because it's random, that doesn't lead to any signaling or influence. It's just the same event that manifests itself at several locations. So that's the best story that I can tell uh, on, uh, on these non-local correlations. OK, and I've wrote a book on that. It's a small book, only 150 pages. So you are, uh, I'd like to thank you for, for your kind attention. I'm waiting for questions. Thank you. <laughs> mm.